Good afternoon and thank you for joining us for virtual Bulldogs Behind the Scenes, featuring an exclusive look of the UMD Greenhouse. Well, my name is Molly Clevin and I'm from the University of Minnesota Duluth Alumni Relations team. Today, we are going to be guided through the tropical plant collection housed at UMD with a focus on unique, unusual, and rare plants. Matthew Yonke is the greenhouse manager in the Department of Biology at UMD. He manages the plant collection, facilitates plant needs for academic classes, assists plant researchers, and participates in various outreach initiatives in the community. Matthew has also served as an adjunct faculty member at UMD and has worked in conjunction with a number of faculty members conducting biological research. It is now my pleasure to hand it over to Matt. Thanks, Molly, for the kind introduction. And I want to thank and welcome all those who are participating in this virtual tour of UMD's greenhouse. I would also like to just thank the alumni relations team as a whole for helping to uh, create and produce this uh, virtual tour and specifically uh, Austin Sommerfeld for his videography and video editing skills. So with that being said, uh, let's begin the tour of UMD's greenhouses. So we have two greenhouses at UMD, um, and right now we're entering our lower greenhouse, specifically the room in front of the greenhouse we call the, the head house, and this is where all the work gets done. So I'm a staff member in the biology department, but I manage a team of uh, undergraduate student employees, and they're really the ones who make the greenhouse work. So in our head house, we, we, have, uh, we store everything, but we, uh, we also uh, we have you know, grow racks that are featured right here, um, just fluorescent lights um, on wire rack shelving, and we propagate a, a ton of different things over the course of a year. Um, right now, you're just seeing like prairie plants, basically, and, and a mixture of other succulents and cacti. But um, we uh, not only do uh, a main goal of the greenhouse is really to facilitate the uh, the academic needs of, of the biology department and, and other departments as well. So a lot of the classes we serve directly are, are biology biology classes, but anything from art and other other departments are also featured and uh, you're just yeah you're seeing basically yeah, we, in our head house is where we, we propagate uh, different plants whether that be from seed whether that be from cutting now you're seeing some bromeliads which i'll talk about a little bit differently um, but in addition to, to facilitating the different uh, academic needs of the university we serve basically as a public conservatory so our greenhouses are, are, are public spaces that anyone can come and walk around in during normal business hours uh, here's a growth chamber which is just a highly programmable um, environmental uh, growth chamber and we use this for classes and other things alike and yeah, and then now you're seeing just kind of the other end of the head house here where we have a number of different soil troughs we, we do a lot of kind of custom mixing of soils uh, different plants have different soil needs and, and we, we mix a lot of the stuff in-house uh, we, we buy a few pre-mixed stuff too but the vast majority we mix mix ourselves to kind of suit the different needs of different plants and now we're entering the greenhouse itself the lower greenhouse and I want to emphasize that the greenhouse is not simply just a, a, a glass house. It's, a, it's, it's a, a working machine of sorts, if you will. And there are motors that open and shut the windows. There are, uh, there's heating, there is uh, ventilation, air movement, and all that kind of works uh, harmoniously to produce the conditions that are needed to keep the specific plants that we grow healthy. So um, you can see a fan there, a heater, and um, it's a well-oiled machine, if you will. And, the first plant we highlight here is just is a straight up pineapple plant. So this is just, you can grow pineapple by just lopping off the top of the pineapple from the store. Um, and then it, this is a few years old, it's getting pretty big. Um, it is yet to produce any actual edible pineapple fruit, but I'm holding, I'm holding on, that'll happen soon. Um, we also have some carnivorous plants. This is a tropical pitcher plant that traps and digests insects. Uh, it's pretty cool. and. Then we also have another group of carnivorous plants called butterwort or pinguicula, which is a really cool plant uh, in my opinion and has kind of a glandular sticky leaf surface that traps and digests insects. Uh, also produce really beautiful flowers. These are these tropical butterworts you can grow in your house quite easily. Uh, Minnesota has one native butterwort species that occurs in a really rare Arctic relic uh, plant group on the North Shore in the rock pools. And I'd be happy to direct you to those if you ever want to visit those on the North Shore. But these are tropical ones. Featured. So, yeah, now we're going to, we're still in the kind of the front of the, uh, the lower greenhouse here. We're going to highlight more groups in the pineapple family. These are all bromeliads. So, um, bromeliads are mainly native to Central and South America, and they have this vase like structure, but they come in all kinds of different uh, 
patterns and colors and uh, variegated leaves. And there's really beautiful plants that have a base like structure. I'm a big, big fan of bromeliads. We have to talk more about those later. And currently now we're entering a, a really popular room. So this is a kind of our succulent and cactus room. Uh, all of these plants uh, share similar uh, environmental conditions. They're all kind of native to the hot, dry, arid uh, locations that tend to yeah, not receive a lot of rainfall. And even though there's a, a lot of different uh, evolutionary line lineages present here, they kind of share a number of traits in common. They tend to be thick, fleshy. Uh, oftentimes, some of them have thorns or spines that kind of serve as a defensive mechanism. And you can imagine in a really dry environment that the, these, you know, the watery tissue of plants would be favorable to, to animals, right? So the, the reason that they have the thorns, they've evolved those thorns over time is, is really as a defense mechanism. So it's also a really good example of uh, what I like to call, what, what, what's called, what is called convergent evolution. So if you think of a, like a, for, for example, a bat and a bird, they're completely unrelated, but they both uh, evolved the ability to have wings and fly. And I think that that's really well illustrated in this, in this room of our greenhouse as well. You have these plants, some of which are very distantly related, evolutionary speaking, and uh, they all, they, they independently evolve these, these thorns, these thick fleshy growth forms. And it's just a really cool example of that in, in the plant world. So we're looking at cacti, true cacti right now, but um, there's a number of other groups specifically, you know, forbias or other plant groups that are also have spines or have uh, kind of that thick fleshy columnar growth pattern. And uh, that's all been, yeah, it's all evolved independently. Um, and it's, it's just a pretty cool example of that. A lot of, we, uh, just as a side note, the greenhouse also, we offer cuttings uh, or clippings, if you want to call them that, of a lot of plants. Not everything, but a lot of them for free. Um, here's showing the euphorbias. You can see they're very cactus-like. These are, these are not cacti. They just completely evolved those traits independently. But yeah, we offer cuttings and clippings of plants. And for most things, for the community, students, staff, faculty, really anyone, um, and, and advice on how to propagate them. We don't really usually give away uh, like soil or pots, but the cuttings and, and the advice come free for most things. Um, now you're kind of seeing another trait that a lot of these arid uh, dry weather plants let have. It's kind of that waxy bluish purplish hue. It's kind of a thick waxy coating to, to conserve water, to prevent water loss in these plants that have evolved in a very dry environment. Um, and the next plant that is, will be featured in a second here is a really new and recent addition to our greenhouse. Um, it was a donation. This is called Pachypodium, native to Madagascar. Has a very thorny armored trunk, as you can see. I wouldn't want to bite into that or even just pop into that. Um, but this was yeah, donated by someone who was moving overseas and they, it was a cool addition to our collection. Now you're seeing an aspirator unit. So this each zone is fitted with an aspirator unit that senses temperature and uh, humidity. And then it relays that information to a control panel, which is featured now. And the control panel then further feeds back to the different infrastructure of the greenhouse. So whether or not we need to open the windows or heat or uh, initiate the, the, the fan. So everything is very harmoniously related and uh, technologically up to date. So, now we're entering a room that's kind of a mess. I'll admit this is the, this room I want to uh, definitely clean up a little bit here, but this is our tropical food room. So we have a lot of edible tropical plants in this room, uh, things like citrus, mango, guava, uh, olive, uh, bay leaf, um, uh, different types of ginger, strawberries, uh, um, cocoa, which I think will be featured here in a second. And that's pretty cool. Uh, we have pomegranate, we have a uh, curry, just a whole slew of tro lemongrass, tropical kind of edible plants. And here's the cocoa tree. And you can see the, the flowers in the cocoa tree literally come right out of the, the stem and the trunk. And that's called cauliflory, which is a really weird um, botanical thing. And then here's, uh, we have just regular culinary ginger, which definitely uh, consumed and ate myself. So now we're pivoting to, I'm going to show a good shot of our kind of middle room, like a that's kind of a cupola and a cupola. And that's uh, basically our, we call it the jungle. And we're going to feature now, basically, in my opinion, the most, the coolest plant that we have in the um, most unique plant in our collection. And this is Amorphophallus titanum. It's called the Titan Arum or the corpse plant. It has, um, what you're looking at right now is basically a single leaf. It looks like a little tree, but it, an individual leaf has a kind of a trunk and then divided leaf at the top that it'll show. And 
this is the vegetative stage of the plant and it alternates between occasionally between a vegetative state and a flowering state the flowering state takes over five years to develop so we've this is about five years old so we have yet to see that yet but the flower that it produces is the largest unbranched floral structure of any flowering plant in the world um, this one's na it's native to sumatra which is an island in indonesia and the flower actually gives off heat and a foul odor that attracts its pollinators which in nature would be flesh-eating beetles and flies so it's just a really cool plant and when these flower at universities it's a big big outreach opportunity and usually draws a lot of attention so i hope to have a live stream of that when it flowers someday uh, we're pivoting to another really cool plant this plant shows a good example of what you know in biology we call a symbiotic relationship when the two organisms kind of have a harmonious relationship where they each get a benefit this is called the bullhorn acacia you can see the, the thorns that are present on the plant now these become hollow and ants reside in those thorns and when the plant is attacked by an herbivore an animal that wants to eat the plant the ants swarm the herbivore the animal and attack the animal def therefore defending the plant and in response, um, so the, the plant gets, de uh, gets a defense, a defensive protection, but the ants get a house in those thorns, and they also get those yellow food packets that you can see at the tip of the leaflets. Those are called Beltian bodies that are rich in protein and lipids. So the plant gets uh, defense from the ants, and the ants get a home and those little yellow food packets um, in exchange. So it's a great example of what we call a symbiotic relationship. Um, and then here's a classic uh, tropical plant you've probably seen in conservatories. It's called the bird of paradise. Kind of the flower structures kind of resemble a bird. They're fluorescent, kind of striking to the eye. And uh, yeah, I just want to mention that in our, you know, we have our collection in, especially in this lower greenhouse, is from around the whole world. I mean, I think we have pretty much every continent well represented, but the vast majority of them are tropical, tropical plants. Um, and as we pivot now into a room that I'm very fond of, my favorite group of plants are orchids. Now most, not everything in here is an orchid, but most of these plants are orchids. And orchids I wanna mention are the, the most, the largest flowering plant uh, family in the world. Uh, they have about 20,000 species in nature. And for reference, uh, Minnesota has 52 native orchid species, but Minnesota's orchids are terrestrial. So they grow out of the ground. Um, Whereas the vast majority of orchid species uh, are tropical and are what we call epiphytes. So epiphytes just mean epi means on top of and phyte means plant. So in nature, most of these tropical orchids would grow on other. They really would really basically grow on trees. They grow in the nooks and crannies of um, of trees on the bark, and uh, so that's why you can get really creative with them when you cultivate them in a greenhouse setting. You can mount them on cork. You can mount them on driftwood. Um, I mean, some of this, this is like this is Lake Superior Driftwood from Park Point or Wisconsin Point. Um, and yeah, you can mount them just basically with fishing line. And then, then, the, then the roots just kind of do their own thing and they stick. And uh, Or if you're putting them in pots, typically we'd grow them in, in moss or a bark mixture, which will be shown a little bit here. But you can get really creative. I'm not super artistic myself, but I've leveraged the wonderful artistic minds of our students here at UMD to help me with that over the years. And that, they have some amazing talent that have helped me with that. So here's a good example of that bark mixture. If you're putting them in a pot, this is a selogeny orchid. It has kind of those thick, fleshy, yellow water storage structures we call pseudo bulbs. Um, so that's just a good example of kind of the mix we'd use if they're potted up. And then we're gonna, this is okay. So you know the Minnesota State Flower is a lady slipper, but this is and this is a lady slipper of type. It's a uh, different, different lineage of orchid. This is a Papiopedilum orchid. Has that same pouch though that you would see where a pollinator would kind of land, a little landing spot for the pollinator. Um, yeah, and this Papiopedilum lady slipper orchid would be native to Asia, and it's got those really beautiful variegated leaves and just that nice kind of cream yellow color of the flower with the speckling, but a different type of lady slipper, not, not our state flower, but a, a different one, um, but still very, very cool. And we have a number of orchids in this group in our collection. And we're pivoting to the fern room. Most of these plants in here are ferns, and ferns are kind of more primitive plants, if you will. You see that really hairy hairy stalk on the this tree fern featured here as the fronds are kind of unfurling that classic fiddlehead shape. Um, tree ferns get really big and kind of form sort of trunk like structures and that's why they're called tree ferns. This one's not that old but um, see that hairy trunk forming and yeah ferns are yeah they're, they're more primitive in that sense they they don't make flowers they don't make seeds uh, they reproduce by spores uh, they tend to need 
a lot more water. It can't, you know, I typically water this room every day. Um, cooler, kind of a little bit more shady conditions are ideal. And, uh, and just now we're kind of panning out to you see the bird's nest for it. it almost looks fake. I mean, they just come in, they're very diverse and just so beautiful. If there's anything next to orchids that I love, it's ferns. So here's showing the spores on the underside of the frond, which is the leaf of a fern. And you can see this one has spores kind of around the margin of the leaf. And that's one way they're arranged. They come in a lot of different arrangements, spore bearing structures. Here's some kind of immature button shaped spore bearing structures on this fern. Then here's there's a little bit more mature, the brown one. So uh, they're not bugs. Those are the reproductive structures of the ferns. So they're supposed to, they're supposed to be there. And um, yeah, and here's a kind of a very obscure fern. We call this a staghorn fern. So it kind of has antler shaped fronds, and that's kind of looks like it's from Mars. But they're um, they're pretty cool plants as well, the staghorn ferns. And I think the next plant that's featured is a is a classic fan favorite of the greenhouse. This is the mimosa or sensitive plant. And this responds to touch, which is in biology we call that stigmotropism. So this is responding to touch. Um, the leaves fold up, and I think that's a it's a res I think it's a ultimately really a way to limit the water loss of the plant. So if the leaves are folded up, they have less, sur less surface area. I've also heard that it makes them kind of less visible to herbivores that might eat them. But I think uh, kids and adults alike really enjoy touching the plant and seeing the leaves fold up. So that's a, that's definitely a fan favorite. Um, and now we're kind of, we're, we just did the full circle of the lower greenhouse. It's octagonally shaped, it's round. You just kind of walk in a circle and back to that front room that features a lot of just classic house plants that you would see, um, ivies and um, bleeding heart vine and just all those kind of really classic house plants um, that you would see uh, in just, yeah, you see all over the place. Uh, so someone wants to know, it's called mimosa, a sensitive plant, mimosa. Someone just asked that plant that moves is called. And here is the mascot of the greenhouse. We have a box turtle that just free roams and her name is Freckles. She's been in there for many years and she's kind of our official greenhouse mascot, uh, box turtle named Freckles. Uh, she's also a fan favorite of many folks. So yeah, now we're, we're going to pivot quickly to the, our other greenhouse. And I want to just highlight that a lot of the other greenhouse is kind of more focused toward research uh, initiatives. So here in the biology department, there's a lot of plant research that occurs. And our other upper greenhouse, which is from the 80s, a little bit more modern, the one you just saw was from the 60s. So this one's a little bit more modern. And right now you're looking at a lot of trees. And I'm actually a part of this project directly. And we're like trying to look at to see how climate change is going to affect the forests in northern Minnesota. That's kind of the goal, the goal of this project. So we've grown thousands of trees that will be planted in northern forests to kind of just test and determine how, uh, yeah, how climate change is affecting forests in northern Minnesota. It's been a a huge endeavor and uh, mostly growing red oak, white pine, and yellow birch right here that you can kind of see in this in this shop. But it's been it's been a big project. And yeah, kind of the last thing I want to focus on is you see all these kind of cute little succulents here. We also do uh, we have a collaboration with UMD stores where we do a twice a year plant sale out of UMD stores um, where we uh, yeah that we that we sell them through basically UMD stores and it's been a pretty pretty successful. Uh, sale over the years, uh, hundreds of plants in the spring and the fall that people kind of eat up. And yeah, so and then you're looking at the outside of our upper greenhouse, um, that one from the 60s. And uh, that concludes the tour. I just want to thank everyone for listening. And I'm happy to answer any questions you have. And uh, I think Molly's going to share my contact info too. Don't hesitate to reach out to me through email with any uh, questions or concerns about the greenhouse or about plants or about plant care or sourcing plants or anything like that. I'd be happy to to uh, facilitate any any questions or concerns anyone has. So with that, I'll turn it back to Molly and I wanna thank everyone for listening. All right. So we had a number of questions submitted in advance, um, but now is the time. If you do have a question, use the question and answer button on the bottom of your screen. Um, we will try to get through as many as we can. Um, so our first question I think we'll kick off with um, is really about the structure and the facility itself. But how is the temperature and environment regulated in the greenhouse? Yeah, and that's a great question because in Duluth, it's just the wild fluctuations, as we all know. Um, yeah, it's all really based on uh, those little units that I kind of showed a little briefly, the aspirator units. They read the temperature and humidity, and they feed that information back to a control panel that feeds that back to the actual motors that open the windows that turn the heat on and off. And the greenhouse that you're looking at right now in the image, this is a very pretty, like I said, it's from the 60s, it's pretty old. It's just single pan, pan, single pane glass, uh, nothing fancy there. Um, and so 
it's kind of remarkable that we can maintain a tropical plant collection when it's, you know, minus 20. And I will say those are kind of some of the coolest days to, no pun intended, but those are really fun to be in the greenhouse when it's minus 20 in January because the ice that forms on the outside of the glass just forms really beautiful, intricate patterns and looks really, really cool. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's a struggle. I imagine it's not a super energy <laughs> uh, efficient uh, when you imagine just a, a huge glass structure in minus 20, but it's really all those environmental control systems that were retrofitted. Um, so back in the day, the greenhouse manager literally had just cranked the windows open manually, but it's all been retrofitted with relatively modern technology. Um, so then beyond the research um, that happens within the greenhouse, what other uses in terms of academics is it used for? Yeah, I mean, beyond the research, so we, we supply plant material to like laboratory classes in biology. So like we'll like schlup, you know, pots up into a into a, an academic laboratory. Um, we have like classes come in and, and just view them in, in real time. Um, so, so it's, yeah, it's kind of, I would say it's mostly biased toward like the biology department, which is the department I'm, I work in, but we do have, we've had other classes like ethnobotany, which is outside of um, biology we, and art classes. I mean, a lot, oftentimes a lot of artists, art students come and they just, they sketch things and it's kind of probably more introductory art classes. Um, and then just a, a resource for the community, really, I think it's, especially this greenhouse they're looking at now is really, it's a public conservatory. I mean, it's not as cool as Como. I'm not going to try to steal Como thunder, but it's, it's kind of analogous to that in the sense that people can just come look at plants and uh, and uh, and just kind of and it's, a, it's kind of a relief for people, I think, especially in winter to get that to sm the smell, to get the greenery in the, in the depths of the cold winter. So, um, yeah, so it, it, yeah, there's a lot of uses. And I think the greenhouse has been really special to a lot of students and community members and staff and faculty. All everyone seems to kind of get into it in the winter, especially in the winter time. So, yeah. Awesome. So we've got a couple questions coming in, um, kind of a two part. Uh, the first one is wondering, does the greenhouse feature Native American cultivation techniques that are adaptable to different regions within the United States? You know, we don't really. And I mean, I, it's something that I would really like to develop. I think it's important and I would love to collaborate with, with any, you know, it, it, you know, I guess, okay, so I guess I'll say this, something I definitely would like to, to do a better job of and, and get more engaged in, the one issue with that is at least the Native American areas around the, the, our current region, Minnesota, um, a lot of the plants are temperate plants. So they're, uh, they're most of our collection is tropical. Um, we do, I will say, have a native plant garden that's not, that was not really featured at all in this, uh, this, this video, but we have a native plant garden in the courtyard that's just outside of where this photo is, is uh, depicting and um, plants native to our region. And I would love to uh, further engage with the Native American community to, rep to, to represent them in not only the greenhouse, but especially just even the, our native outdoor plant garden that we do currently have. So I think there's a lot of room for growth there. Um, but I think within the greenhouse itself, a lot of the stuff that we grow is temperate, or sorry, tro excuse me, tropical, meaning that it's not really native to our region, it's made native to the tropics, but I would love to engage with the Native American community and incorporate that perspective, especially with our outdoor native plant garden, that'd be amazing. So then you kind of answered this one in terms of the outdoor native garden, um, but this person is wondering, do you grow uh, Native American corn, beans, squash, um, any of those? We don't really grow a lot of, and, and like I said, I showed you the food room and that was all tropical stuff. Um, we don't, but there's room for that. I mean, we, in addition just to our, our outdoor native garden, we also have some uh, garden troughs that um, like big metal troughs that I just use, I typically would just grow veggies in if they're unused by anyone else. But I mean, there's there's definitely, I, whoever's asking these questions, please reach out to me because I think that there's a tremendous opportunity for collaboration and I'm I'm more than happy and willing to to get that ball rolling. Um, but we don't grow a lot of, in, in inside the greenhouse, it's mostly tropical stuff. So, yeah. um, do you ever collaborate with the UMD farm and land lab? Yeah, so uh, no, we don't. Um, we don't really collaborate with the, the land lab. Uh, the land lab is uh, kind of housed in a completely different department from biology. They're not, you'd think that they would be in the biology department, but they're, they're not in the biology department. Uh, so we really don't collaborate with them at all. We do have, within biology, a lot of our faculty and graduate students do have, we do have a research farm that's kind of adjacent to that 
um, land lab out on Gene Duluth Road in Duluth, if you're familiar with it. So we do have a research farm that we collaborate with, but we don't really collaborate with the land lab, just I think because of the logistics of them being housed in a completely different department. So, yeah. Great, thanks. Um, so you mentioned freckles, um, and this person has seen that freckles has made an appearance on your social media pages. Wondering if you can share a little bit more of, about Freckles role within the greenhouse. Yeah, Freckles. Um, so my predecessor, who some of you attending, if you're alumni, would definitely know, my predecessor in this role is named, is, her name is uh, Deb Schubat, and she's kind of a, she's a pretty, uh, she's kind of a pillar in our community, and amazing uh, person, and was amazing resources. I transitioned. She retired. She had this position since the 80s, I believe. So she was like a greenhouse legend and it was very big shoes to fill. And I really, Deb is amazing. And uh, so Freckles arose sometime during her tenure. There actually was, there was another turtle, which I don't know what the name was. There were two turtles um, at one point, but I don't, I don't exactly know how old Freckles is. I'm guessing she's at, at gotta be at least 10 years old. And she just kind of, she literally is just a free roaming turtle. Um, and I think people oftentimes are caught off guard when they see her because they're like, wow, there's a turtle there. So I've had people say like, do you know there's a turtle right there? It's like, yeah, I know she's there. You know, it's, of course I know she's there. We feed her and care for her, but she's just a free roaming turtle who's been there for a long time. And in the winter, when it gets cold, she kind of does a pseudo dormant sea period where she buries herself and kind of, um, and kind of so, sort of hibernates, if you will, but I don't think it's a true hibernation, but I'm not a reptile. Uh, expert, so I, I'm not, but I, I do care for her well. She's just a free roaming turtle who's been in the greenhouse for a long, long time. That's all I really know. That's awesome. Thanks. Um, so with the image um, on the screen right now, um, just wondering exactly where the greenhouse is located and it may be the easiest access point for the community to visit. Great question. So the, this is that. Yeah, this is our lower greenhouse. This is our quote unquote public conservatory, if you will. Uh, it's located, the greenhouse itself is located in a courtyard that's kind of surrounded by the med school and the life science building. And uh, the room number, you, you, uh, you don't enter the greenhouse from outside, you go into a building to enter the greenhouse. Um, and the, the room, it's in, it's, so it's technically in, in the life sciences building, uh, room 20 on the ground floor. And if you just want to simply pop in and visit, there are uh, a number of metered parking spaces uh, off of University Drive in front of the med school. That's probably the closest area. Um, our other greenhouse is attached to the same building, but if you guys know UMD, it's kind of everything connected. It's kind of weird. So the other greenhouse is two stories up on the second floor of Life Sciences, and that's probably easy, e easiest to ac access from this uh, Kirby Drive and those metered spots acro across from that large uh, sculpture that's um, by that disc golf area. So. Yeah, so they're both attached to life science. Uh, and if you just want to visit, you probably, your best bet might be just to find a metered spot. I would recommend close to the med school in one of the metered locations. And then in terms of the tour, is it predominantly just self-guided or is there a staff person, a student available to, to give a yeah. tour once you're yeah. Yeah, so if anyone wants a tour of the greenhouse, uh, I can offer one a personal private tour just for free from me. Um, but you're also just welcome to to wander around. It's yeah, so it can be either or. I'm I I am happy to offer uh, a personalized tour to any, even if it's a single individual or a small group of people. And I'm happy to do either or. And uh, generally speaking, the, this lower greenhouse is kind of open to the public like weekdays and during normal business hours. I would say so, like roughly eight to four thirty ish. Um, but if someone you know it, it does it helps to like if you you know if you really want to. A personalized tour just reach out to me through email um, in advance but yeah weekdays kind of eight to four and it can be a uh, self-guided or it can be uh, an actual tour I've given tours from anything from preschoolers to elderly people and everything in between so I've, I've had a wide uh, sweep of uh, people I've given tours to for sure awesome and then as far as um, you mentioned getting clippings of plants um, would that be something that they should set up through an appointment or visit and stop by um, how would you advise yeah I mean if you're yeah I would say probably doesn't hurt to uh, con contact me in advance for clippings um, just ask that either myself or one of my employees kind of does it just to make sure that it's a plant that we're willing to kind of do that with and of course not even every plant can be propagated that way but 
um, yeah, we asked that you know either myself or one of my other uh, wonderful student employees um, gives them a, a clipping. But it, 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 yeah, I think if, if you can find me, um, I'm happy to do it on the fly. But it probably doesn't hurt to to uh, have a, a request in advance. And then, as far as your spring and fall plant sales, when do those typically take place? Yeah, so um, those, yeah, so once again, those are in conjunction with UMD stores, and I typically the fall one is in eh, a couple weeks into the semester, so maybe late September, and then the spring one tends to be in April. Um, I usually just kind of let them pick the dates, uh, and they do. I'm sure that they advertise it to a certain degree. I mean, things have been a little bit weird with the pandemic. Like they've kind of slowed down a little bit. Our, you know, when there was no one around, the sale wasn't as successful. But in, you know, in, in quote unquote normal times, like we, yeah, we we sell 400 plants in a week, so it seems to be pretty popular. Uh, and yeah, they're in little four and a half inch pots, uh, really healthy, robust plants. But um, once again, you don't need to. You can if you have a little bit of plant propagation skill. You can just get the cuttings for, for, for a lot of stuff for free if you just contact me. But I still support, I love that we have this collaboration with UMB stores and, and we sell them really good plants. But yeah, typically late September uh, and then um, sometime in April. Um, and I'm sure that they advertise it on, I would hope on, on, through email or their website or social media or whatever that they have, so yeah. And I actually think that the plant propagation is an idea that we might explore for another behind the scenes. So. We'll throw that out. Um, the last question uh, you sort of answered um, during your presentation uh, with the orchids, but what are some other favorite plants and specimens of yours within the greenhouse? Yeah, um, yeah, it's, I would say mostly orchids and ferns. Uh, I really like orchids. The or group of orchids that I really get into are in the genus Dendrobium. And those are a lot of those are native to Papua New Guinea, um, so that's kind of Southeast Asia. That's kind of where a lot of the, I just for some reason I just have an affinity for those. That's they, they resonate with me. Um, ferns I love just because they're very delicate, kind of just uh, I would you know just beautiful. I, I think that as far as like the individual specimens though, I think that the ones that I highlighted, that Titanarum one is really special to our collection. And when that blooms, I think it'll be a really cool thing. I hope I can keep it alive long enough to bloom. I mean. It's about four or five years old now. So that'll be a really big outreach event. And I hope that we can make that a big deal with the community. Um, and, but yeah, it's, yeah, it's just, I think I pretty much covered my favorites. Uh, orchids and ferns are what to get into. You can imagine being a greenhouse manager that my house is chock full of plants too. So um, I, I'm out of space, um, but it has been fun. Just, I guess I'll say one more thing. It's been really fun to grow to that tree project that was highlighted at the end of the, the end of the video. It's been really cool to learn how to grow trees and, um, I don't know. I just yeah. Trees are so long lived, and you know, it's just really it's cool to grow a, a tree from a little tiny seed, and and then see it grow huge after years, after years, after years. So I've really enjoyed growing trees, and I want. I think I want to keep keep doing that more. So. Oh, awesome! Well, thank you so much, Matt, for taking the time um, to give us this tour of the greenhouse. And there were other questions that weren't necessarily addressed today. Feel free to reach out some contact information for both um, Matt and for our office. Um, additionally, if you're not an alum and you're joining today, um, we do average about one to two virtual events a month um, in alumni relations. So feel free to send us an email um, and we will get you added to those lists. Um, again, thank you so much, Matt, and for all of you for joining us today. Um, we hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you.